London. July 7th, 2005. Terrorist attacks leave over 50 people dead and hundreds injured. There will, of course, now be the most intense police and security service action to make sure that we bring those responsible to justice. The most important statement I can make, however, is the implacable resolve of the Metropolitan Police Service to track down those who are responsible for these terrible events. The police investigation took nearly 20,000 witness statements, examined 40,000 exhibits and cost £100 million, but no one has ever been convicted of involvement in 7-7. We have gone where the evidence has taken us, following every lead until it is exhausted. It's impossible, in, in a few words, to convey the scale of the task we set ourselves. But if I tell you that we have taken more than 15,000 statements and followed some 19,000 leads, that might give you some idea. Within hours of the explosions, officials were spreading the word that this was the work of Al-Qaeda. This particular attack bears the hallmarks of Al-Qaeda. The government said tonight this had all the hallmarks of an Al-Qaeda attack. On the evening of the attacks, the mainstream media were already talking about suicide bombers. Police are investigating whether it was the work of a suicide bomber. If confirmed, this would be unprecedented in Western Europe. The following day, the police said that they didn't have any evidence that the attacks were suicide bombings. We have absolutely nothing to suggest that this was a suicide bombing attack. Though the security services said that they had no foreknowledge or warning about the attacks, within days the police had identified four men as the culprits. Everyone kind of just looked, to, looked towards the Muslims thinking, oh, it was their fault, it was them. But I think the fact that everyone did that was a really ignorant thing to do. Three other men who knew the alleged bombers were arrested in 2007. They were accused of involvement in 7-7, but after two trials were found innocent. Why should we believe that the four alleged bombers were responsible for the attacks? The police identified them almost immediately, but the only trials to have resulted from the investigation were based on flimsy evidence and assumption. It has to be said, it was always a case built on circumstantial evidence. That said, it was a very, very thorough investigation. I think somehow the family now needs to draw a line underneath this. The record of the British authorities in major terrorism and murder cases is terrible. More often than not, either the wrong people have been investigated, prosecuted and convicted, or no one has been held responsible. In many instances, the plots or attacks were actually instigated by undercover agents, informants or provocateurs. Around the turn of the 20th century, the Western world fought a war on terror against the first red menace, the militant aspects of the labour movement, communism and anarchism. Bombs went off in the streets of major cities and there were assassination attempts against heads of state. The international anarchist movement, a mixture of idealists and militants, largely took the blame, but the movement was heavily infiltrated by spies. In 1892, six men were arrested in England and accused of planning bombings and running a bomb factory. They became known as the Walsall Anarchists. They were put on trial, where three of them maintained that the whole thing was a plot by the police. When the police refused to answer questions at the trial about a seventh man, Auguste Coulon, the judge ruled in their favour. Coulon was a half-Irish, half-Frenchman who was paid by the police to inform on the group. He was obsessed with dynamite and wrote inflammatory articles for the anarchist journal, The Commonweal. When he wrote a piece celebrating the blowing up of a cow in Belgium, the editor refused to publish it. It caused a rift between the two, and the editor, David Nicoll, later wrote a pamphlet saying that Auguste Coulon was a police spy and that he had set up the Walsall anarchists. Some of the key evidence at the trial were letters between Coulon and the defendants, including diagrams on how to make bomb cases. Coulon provided advice and encouragement, but the diagrams were so poor that the police had to make changes to them before the trial. The Walsall anarchists never actually made any bomb cases, 
so the police manufactured some and used them as prosecution exhibits. Four of the men were found guilty, and three of them were given 10-year prison sentences. Recent investigations have confirmed the suspicion that Coulon was an informant and agent provocateur paid by the police. He was recruited by William Melville of Special Branch. Melville was a friend of Harry Houdini and adored the art of deception. He later became head of the Secret Service Bureau, the forerunner to MI5. Another policeman, Patrick McIntyre, had alleged at the time that Coulon was a provocateur. McIntyre had argued with Melville and found himself demoted, so he quit the police and published his memoirs in a newspaper. He explained how Coulon was unemployed but had a steady supply of money from his work for the police. McIntyre also said that he considered the anarchists a peaceful bunch and that the Walsall anarchists were innocent. He commented that, a clever and cunning man, having his wits about him and with plenty of money at his command, can always impose upon the unwary and make believe he is engaged on a revolutionary crusade, when his real object is to sell the liberty of his dupes at the highest possible price. During the Second World War, the British ran a double agent programme through the 20 Committee, so called because in Roman numerals the number 20 is a double cross. One of the best examples is the story of two Norwegians, John Moe and Tor Glad, codenamed Mutt and Jeff after the popular cartoon characters. Their security service file details how they were recruited by the Nazis after the occupation of Norway and were sent to Britain to spy and commit acts of sabotage. They left Stavanger by seaplane, were dropped in the North Sea in a dinghy and rowed ashore to Aberdeenshire. They immediately gave themselves up to local police and were handed over to MI5. They were turned and became double agents and worked on a variety of covert operations. They used radios supplied to them by the Germans to send back misleading messages. This helped persuade the Nazis that the British were planning an invasion of Norway from the south, when in fact there was no such intention. This was part of an overall deception operation that culminated in convincing the Germans that the D-Day invasion of France would be at Calais instead of Normandy. The security services even carried out sabotage attacks inside Britain to convince the Nazis that Mutt and Jeff were still loyal and successful agents. An operation codenamed Guy Fawkes saw British intelligence agents and police plant incendiary bombs in a food depot outside London. The plan went wrong as just after they had sneaked in and set off the devices, the fire was spotted by a local police sergeant. The fire service arrived and put out the flames. When investigators arrived they found the remnants of the bombs, which they identified as those being used by the security services. The personal file on Mutt says that, this led to a very delicate situation in connection with the inquiry being made by Scotland Yard. Ultimately, however, the inquiry died out. Another set of operations persuaded the Germans to make equipment drops by parachute. This enabled MI5 to assess the quality of the equipment that the Germans were giving to their spies, and to make future staged attacks look more authentic. Another phony sabotage operation was carried out on a small power station. The security service file notes how this not only made Mutt and Jeff look more credible in the eyes of the Germans, but also provided a security stimulus to the British public, making them more alert to the possibility of real sabotage attacks. The MI5 file concluded that in cases like Mutt and Jeff's, that friends as well as enemies must be completely deceived. While the British always had confidence in Mutt, they found Jeff to be unreliable and indiscreet. On one mission to Aberdeen to gather information, he was arrested due to his carelessness and indiscretion. He was not allowed out without watchers after that. Jeff complained about this and his meagre allowance. After several months, his handlers decided that it was more trouble than it was worth to keep a constant watch on him and said that he would either have to be given complete liberty or be interned. The first option was deemed impossible because of suspicions about his loyalty. He was imprisoned on the Isle of Man, and at the end of the war was sent back to Norway to face charges of being a spy for the Nazis. 
What this shows is that intelligence assets who are trusted are protected from investigation by the authorities, but those who are not trusted can be handed over to the authorities as a way of maintaining control over them. In 1921, following the Irish War of Independence, Ireland was partitioned. 26 counties in the south formed their own country, the Republic of Ireland. Six counties in the north remained under British control. The Protestants in the north were mostly loyal to the British and treated the Catholic minority there with contempt and discrimination. The Catholics in the south largely believed that Ireland should be one single republic. In the late 1960s, the tension spiralled into violence. Since that time, the British, and the Northern Irish in particular, have fought a low-intensity conflict against paramilitary Republican groups. In return, the Republicans have carried out hundreds of terrorist attacks, including dozens on the British mainland. The Republican groups, in particular the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, were systematically infiltrated by British military or intelligence agents. The undercover agents helped mix explosives, plan attacks, carry out surveillance, and conspired with the terrorists to keep the conflict running. The loyalist paramilitary groups were also infiltrated. They were closely monitored, and at times directed against Republican targets or other enemies of the British state. This is the area of North Belfast where the loyalist Ulster Volunteer Force gang was based, its leadership riddled with informers. When this collusion became widely known about, it sparked off several major inquiries, all of which concluded that the British agents were partly responsible for the violence of the last 40 years. The police ombudsman's report shows that a serial killer was protected by special branch and paid by the state for years. Anywhere else that would be a national scandal. Among these inquiries, in April 2003 the investigation by Sir John Stevens, then Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, published its third report. Though most of the report is not publicly available, the summary and recommendations state that I conclude that there was collusion in both murders and the circumstances surrounding them. Collusion is evidenced in many ways. This ranges from the willful failure to keep records, the absence of accountability, the withholding of intelligence and evidence, through to the extreme of agents being involved in murder. The failure to keep records, or the existence of contradictory accounts, can often be perceived as evidence of concealment or malpractice. It limits the opportunity to rebut serious allegations. The absence of accountability allows the acts or omissions of individuals to go undetected. The withholding of information impedes the prevention of crime and the arrest of suspects. The unlawful involvement of agents in murder implies that the security forces sanction killings. Despite these inquiries, not a single British government agent has been prosecuted for their involvement in these crimes. Part of the reason for this is that from the very beginning there has been an agreement not to prosecute military or intelligence officers involved in the war in Northern Ireland. At a meeting in 1971 with the Attorney General, a senior British Army officer based in Northern Ireland discussed how he had no doubt that the Attorney General is doing all within his power to protect the security forces against criminal proceedings in respect of actions on duty, and that he was satisfied that there was no need to remind him of the danger to morale inherent in prosecutions of soldiers or policemen. Among the attacks provoked by this collusion were those using human bombs, also known as proxy bombs. Typically, a man's family would be kidnapped and he would be threatened with their torture or murder unless he agreed to drive a car bomb into a military checkpoint or other target. Though this is distinct from a conventional, intentional suicide bomber, it could be described as an unwilling suicide bomber. Alongside the killing and maiming of thousands of people, the authorities were also responsible for numerous miscarriages of justice. In 1974, London was in the midst of a year-long terrorist campaign by the Balcombe Street Gang, an active unit of the IRA. In October, two bombs exploded in pubs in Guildford, killing five people. Weeks later, another bomb in a pub in Woolwich killed two. In December, the police arrested four people. They were forced to confess to the bombings, and in 1975 were convicted and given 15-year prison sentences. Seven others were also arrested and charged with possession of explosives that had been given to the IRA. 
They went on trial in 1976 and received sentences of up to 14 years. All 11 were completely innocent. People felt very hysterical about it and, and felt glad that these bastards had been nailed. They had no sense that the wrong people had been nailed. The likely culprits of the pub bombings were the Balcombe Street Gang, who admitted at their trial in 1977 that they were responsible and that the Guildford Four were innocent. It was another 12 years before it was established that the police had manipulated their notes from the interviews with the Guildford Four, an appeal granted, and the conviction squashed. The Maguire Seven served out their sentences before being released in 1989, though for one of them, Giuseppe Conlon, it was too late. He died in prison in 1980. Eleven years after his death, the convictions were overturned. The police had forced their confessions and withheld evidence that could have exonerated them. In 2005, then Prime Minister Tony Blair issued an apology to the 11 who'd been wrongly convicted. But it serves no one for the wrong people to be convicted for such an awful crime. Though he ignored many other similar cases from the same period. In 1974, Judith Ward was found guilty of carrying out three bombings. Though she was mentally unstable and prone to making false confessions, the police took her confession seriously and she served 18 years in prison. In 1975, the Birmingham Six were convicted of having carried out several bombings on pubs. They had been beaten up and forced to confess, and a forensic scientist falsely testified that they had handled explosives. The police also suppressed evidence that could have exonerated them. They were eventually freed in 1991. In each of these cases, no one was justly convicted of the original terrorist crimes, and no police or prosecution service officer was punished for the wrongful convictions. I think that it's a travesty of justice as much for the victims as it was for the people who were put in prison for crimes they didn't commit. The same is true of the 1998 bomb attack in Omar, Northern Ireland. The real IRA, a splinter group of the original IRA, carried out a car bomb attack that killed 29 and wounded over 200. Colm Murphy was tried and convicted, but he was released after it emerged that the police had forged the notes from the interview. His nephew, Sean Hoey, was put on trial and found innocent. Questions and theories remain about who was responsible for the Omar bombing. The BBC investigated, but they only looked at the question of whether the electronic spying agency GCHQ had foreknowledge of the attack. The real scandal is that there was a huge amount of intelligence on the killers, but it was never passed to the police responsible for catching them. They failed to investigate allegations that the security services had an informant within the group who warned them about the bombing ahead of time. The theory is that the security services deliberately failed to stop the bombing so as to protect their informant's secret status. Relatives of those killed in the Omer bombing in 1998 have said they're astonished by the disclosure that the British security service MI5 withheld vital anti-terrorism intelligence just months before the attack. According to security sources in the north, MI5 failed to inform Special Branch of the threat of a bomb plot. The details emerged as part of an investigation into an FBI agent who infiltrated the real IRA which carried out the attack. Just as with other cases, the only question asked of the security services was what did they know and when did they know it, rather than what were they doing and why were they doing it. That the British state can be complicit in murder, and get away with it, was shown only 15 days after 7-7, with the murder of Jean Charles de Menezes. Apparently, mistakes and bad luck led the police to wrongly identify Menezes as a suicide bomber. They followed him into a tube station and onto a train, before pinning him to the floor and shooting him several times. Initial eyewitness reports said that Menezes was wearing a bulky jacket with wires trailing from it, and that he jumped over the ticket barrier and ran onto the train. The police claimed that they had shouted a warning and that Menezes had ignored them. And the man was challenged and refused to obey police instructions. I saw, I, I saw an Asian guy. He, he looked Pakistani, 
he had a baseball cap on and, and a sort of um, quite a thick padded coat. It, it was sort of a most unusual sort of coat for this this type of uh, weather, is it? The authorities claimed that there was no CCTV showing Menezes' behaviour in the minutes leading up to his death. None of this was true. The police even manipulated an image of Menezes, making him look more like Hussein Osman, the man they say they suspected he was when they shot him. They even accused one of their own senior officers of lying about how long it was after the shooting that they realised Menezes was innocent. Despite clear evidence of a cover-up, not a single officer, either on the ground or further up the chain of command, was held responsible. The Metropolitan Police were found guilty, but only on health and safety grounds. At Menezes' inquest, the jury were ordered not to return a verdict of unlawful killing, even though that's exactly what killed him. The authorities did not learn. In June 2006, after lengthy surveillance and a tip-off from an informant, the police raided two houses in Forest Gate, North London. They believed that the houses were a factory for a chemical bomb and that two men that were living there were terrorists. Shortly after the raid began, they shot one of the men in the shoulder, seriously wounding him. They tore the house apart looking for evidence. I just see an orange spark and a big bang. At that time, I flew, I flew onto the wall. The operation cost over £2 million and involved 250 police officers, but the men were completely innocent and were freed within days. I apologise for the hurt that we may have caused. Two months after the raid, the Independent Police Complaints Commission published a report saying that the shooting was accidental. On the same day, the police re-arrested Mohammed Abdul Kahar, the man they had shot, on child pornography charges. Images were found on a mobile phone and a computer seized during the raid, but the charges were dropped because there was no evidence that Kahar had downloaded or copied them. No police or intelligence officer has ever been held responsible for the raid, the shooting or the trumped-up charges. The police did receive specific intelligence we were left with no choice but to act upon that intelligence. We had no choice but to mount a robust operation which required a fast, armed response. It has been alleged that the informant was Abu Bakr Mansha, a man with a very low IQ, convicted of a ludicrous terrorist plot in late 2005, though this has been denied. The intelligence and information behind the raid has never been made public. In September 2006, police raids across the southeast of England resulted in the arrests of 14 men. In late 2007, six of the men went on trial, accused of providing or receiving terrorism training and of inciting people to commit murder. In February 2008, after a long deliberation, the jury found five of the men guilty. The alleged leader of the group, who was found guilty of incitement to murder and providing terrorism training within the UK, was Mohammed Hamid. The actual leader of the group was Attila Ahmet, a close associate of Abu Hamza, who pleaded guilty to incitement to murder before the trial. In total, eight men have been convicted of receiving terrorism training at camps supposedly run by Hamid. From the mainstream media coverage, you might think he was a hardcore fanatic running a production line for terrorists. In reality, Hamid ran a dawah stall in London where he gave away books and DVDs on Islam. He has expressed scepticism about the official versions of both 9-11 and 7-7. Everybody knows, everybody knows that 9-11 was not done by Osama. This is facts. It was through his stall that he first came to the attention of the authorities, and he was monitored on a camping trip to the Lake District in May 2004. This and several other trips to countryside areas have been portrayed as Mohammed Hamid running terrorism training camps. Mobile phone videos from some of these trips were used as evidence in court. 
This is what terror training looks and sounds like. The clips show the men leaping over rivers, playing with sticks and doing forward rolls. One clip that shows the men cheering as one of them sliced the top off a melon was used by the prosecution as proof that they were practicing to carry out beheadings. Other evidence included footage from a BBC documentary that featured Hamid, called Don't Panic, I'm Islamic, broadcast just before 7-7. The apparent aim of the film was to show that British Muslims are nothing to fear. Hamid was interviewed for the film and came across as zany, but completely harmless. Osama's a beautiful name, right? And it is a beautiful name, right? And I, I turn around and tell a lot of people, my name is Osama bin Laden. I've been London. <laughs> The BBC paid for Hamid and others to go paintballing in Kent in February 2005. This was later used as evidence of Hamid providing terrorism training. The producer of the documentary appeared as a defence witness and after the trial was interviewed by Channel 4. The point about Mohammed Hamid is he was an open book. Um, there was nothing secretive about him. Um, so that makes me wonder about the nature of this case really. The mobile phone videos were presented alongside testimony from a member of the British Army. When it came to one particular body position seen on the footage, Soldier A, as he was known, told the court, I've seen it used by insurgents while in Iraq and the Taliban in Afghanistan. It's a favoured position of insurgents and Taliban. The trial also featured testimony from an undercover policeman who had infiltrated Mohammed Hamid's circle of friends via his bookstall. The prosecution maintained that the undercover agent was just an ordinary member of the public when he first met Hamid. Secret recordings were also used as prosecution evidence. In surveillance tapes heard by the jury, Hamid also talked about the 7-7 attacks. How many people did they take out, he asks. 52 is the reply. That's not even breakfast for me, says Hamid. That's not even breakfast for me in this country. The undercover agent testified that such statements were serious solicitations to murder. Hamid was sentenced to seven and a half years in prison, though the judge ruled he be incarcerated until he changes his beliefs about the world. This is the first time that an imprisonment for public protection order has been used in a terrorism case in Britain. As such, for going camping, letting the BBC take him paintballing, and making some poorly judged statements, Hamid could stay in prison for the rest of his life. Those who know about his case generally believe that Hamid was set up by the authorities and that he is completely innocent. It may be significant that the only man who was prosecuted but not convicted, Musa Brown, was approached by MI5 shortly after his arrest. This was after, my, after I'd been charged and my solicitor had gone. I was approached by the spooks in the interview room afterwards. And the first thing they said to me, was assalamu alaikum and I looked the guy up and down I thought to myself what's going on here and then the guy said to me the first thing he said to me and he will always stay in my mind he goes we know you're not a terrorist but we can help you two other cases that are connected to 7-7 bear the same hallmarks of manipulation and unjust prosecution in May 2007, four people were arrested, among them Hasina Patel, the wife of alleged 7-7 ringleader Mohammed Sadiq Khan. Another man, Khalid Khalik, had known two of the alleged bombers and been involved with the Ikra Bookshop and Learning Centre in Leeds. After his house was searched, Khalik was charged with possession of material likely to be of use for terrorism. The document in question was the Al-Qaeda training manual, military studies in jihad against the tyrants. It was found in Khalik's house, on a CD in a box in his attic. He denied even knowing that it was there. The manual on the CD had been downloaded at the Ikra bookshop, probably by IT man Martin Gilbertson. Khalik's case echoed a similar story of five students, mostly from Bradford. They were arrested in March 2006 for having downloaded jihadi material from the internet. In July 2007, they were all found guilty and were given a total of 13 years in prison. In February 2008, they won an appeal and were freed. 
I'm feeling I'm just happy to see the flu. And I say I'm just happy to be out, so... An appeal judge ruled that literature may be stored in a book, on a bookshelf, or on a computer drive, without any intention on the part of the possessor to make any future use of it at all. A month later, in March 2008, Khalid Khalik pleaded guilty and received a sentence of 16 months. The punishment is extremely unjust, because there is no evidence that Khalik downloaded the manual, or copied it onto a CD, or was going to use it for anything. The manual was used as evidence in the US versus Bin Laden trial in 2001, and had subsequently been published on the US Justice Department's website. A hard copy has been listed for purchase on Amazon, and in other major bookshops. Furthermore, the manual was authored by Ali Mohammed, an associate of Osama Bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri, who also worked for the CIA, the FBI, and the United States Special Forces. Most of its contents were adapted from CIA and US military training manuals. How can it be illegal to own a document produced by a US government agent and published by the US Justice Department? Khalik has obviously been the victim of a terrible miscarriage of justice, for no better reason than because he knew some of the alleged 7-7 bombers. Three other men who were also part of that group of friends were arrested in March 2007. Wahid Ali, Mohammed Shakil and Sadir Salim were put on trial, charged with having been involved in the conspiracy that resulted in the 7-7 bombings. They were accused of having carried out hostile reconnaissance during a trip to London in December 2004, when they met up with two of the alleged 7-7 bombers. This is described as a reconnaissance mission. The prosecution say the locations they visited bore a striking similarity to the bombers' eventual targets. But this wasn't true. Ali, Shakil and Salim visited the London Eye, the London Aquarium and the Natural History Museum, but they did not go to Tavistock Square or to any of the tube stations that were affected on 7-7. In August 2008, the jury couldn't come to a verdict on the case. Though the evidence was circumstantial at best, the Crown prosecuted the men a second time. They were finally found innocent in April 2009, over two years after they'd been arrested. Even though I have been acquitted, some people will always associate me with these events. I want people to know I am totally innocent and I want there to be an inquiry as to why I was prosecuted on the flimsiest of evidence. In my view, the police wanted somebody, anybody, to pay for the murder of 52 people. These investigations and trials were the main delay in holding inquests or inquiries into what happened on 7-7. They produced no convictions whatsoever in connection with the London bombings. Instead, they were a litany of false accusations, ridiculous evidence, undercover agents and police violence. After the second alleged co-conspirators trial in 2009, that was the end of the police and prosecution service involvement in the 7-7 investigation. It was another year and a half before the government held inquests into the deaths of the innocent victims of the attacks. In October 2010, the inquests began. Five months of hearings produced thousands of pages of exhibits and testimony, but in many cases the evidence either did not support the government's narrative, or contradicted it. The proceedings were largely controlled by two people. The coroner, Lady Justice Hallett, who decided which witnesses and evidence could be examined, and the government's lawyer, Hugo Keith QC, who directed the questioning. Though Hallett concluded that the government's narrative was correct in all its key points, a closer examination of the evidence proves that conclusion to be a hollow one. One of the main aspects of the official story of 7-7 is that the alleged bombers were working essentially alone. There were several indications from the inquest proceedings that there was, as some have suspected, a larger plot. According to the official story, Three of the alleged bombers picked up their explosive devices from their bomb factory in Alexandra Grove, Leeds, on the morning of 7-7.
At the start of the inquests, the court heard from Sylvia Waugh, an elderly lady who lives in Alexandra Grove. She testified how in the months before the bombings she had seen as many as six or seven men coming and going at the supposed bomb factory. This tallies with reports that there were as many as ten unidentified sets of fingerprints found inside the flat. She was hazy on describing the men, saying of coloured people and Pakistanis, to me they all look alike. Mrs. War also described how she was awoken at around 4am on the morning of 7-7 and saw at least six men loading rucksacks into the back of a car. Mrs. War said that she thought that they were drug dealers. She then saw four of the men get into a bluey car and saw at least one of the men leave in a different white car. According to the Home Office narrative, there should have been only one car in Leeds and only three men. The other men, and the other car that Mrs. War mentioned, have never been traced. The detail that there were four men in the car that drove down from Leeds also came up in the testimony of a woman that was at Luton Station on the morning of 7-7. The narrative claims that Khan, Tanweer and Hussain drove a rented light purple Nissan Micra down from Leeds to Luton and that Jermaine Lindsay drove across from Aylesbury to Luton in his red Fiat Brava. Sue Clark said that she'd noticed the two cars in Luton Station car park and the group of men around them because they'd parked in what was her usual parking place. In her statement to police shortly after 7-7, Sue Clark said that there were one or two men in the Fiat Brava and four men in the Lilac Nissan by the time of the inquests, she could only remember three men in the Micra and one man in the Brava, conveniently fitting in with the government's narrative. The same number of six men also turned up in the testimony of one of the Home Office narrative's key witnesses about what he had seen at King's Cross. The official narrative states, at around 8.30am, four men fitting their descriptions are seen hugging. They appear happy, even euphoric. Though the narrative does not tell us this, the source for this information was a passenger at King's Cross called Joseph Martokia, who reported what he had seen to the police. A closer look at Martokia's testimony casts doubt on what the Home Office and mainstream media say he saw. He described a group of four to six men, said that they were all Asian, and that he thought they were a sports team. This group of, of men uh, appeared to be uh, a sports team uh, and uh, they, they were in track suits, they were carrying very large rucksacks. I assume them to be a cricket team. Martokia identified two of the men from photographs of the alleged bombers, Hasib Hussain and Shazad Tanweer, though his descriptions are less than perfect. He described Hussain's hair as being much shorter on the sides than in the photo he was shown but according to the CCTV, it wasn't. He said he saw Hussein go towards the Piccadilly line when the group split up. But according to the Home Office narrative, it was Jermaine Lindsay who bombed the Piccadilly line, who Martokia didn't recognise at all. He also said that Tanweer was noticeably shorter than the others, and that he was much shorter than Hussein. If Martokia did see the four alleged bombers, then it appears he saw other men stood with them, just as in other witnesses' statements. If he saw other people who weren't the alleged bombers, then the iconic hug moment in the Home Office narrative never actually happened. Between Sylvia War, Sue Clark, and Joseph Martokia, witnesses at each stage of the alleged bombers' journey saw more men alongside them. But no fifth or sixth conspirator has ever been found. We needed to find out who else knew what was going to happen on the 7th of July. Who encouraged the bombers? Who supported them? Another possible sign of a wider conspiracy is the Jaguar at Luton Station. On July 7, a car apparently driven by Jermaine Lindsay arrived in Luton Station car park shortly after 5 o'clock in the morning. The CCTV from Luton does not show Lindsay himself until he entered the station at 6.40. Ten minutes later, for no obvious reason, Lindsay moved his car to a different parking spot. Just after he parks the car, the CCTV footage cuts out for a minute and a half. In the meantime, as noticed by an eagle-eyed July 7th researcher, a Jaguar has parked in the foreground. Seconds later, 
the other car driving the men down from Leeds arrives in Luton Station car park, and the Jaguar immediately starts up and moves. Just as the car from Leeds parks next to Lindsay's car, the footage cuts out for another minute, so we cannot see what happened to the Jaguar. Some people think that it parked here, a few spaces up from the alleged bombers. On the 28th of June, nine days before 7-7, three of the alleged bombers took a trip to London, which has been widely portrayed as some kind of rehearsal. Only three of the men travelled to London, and aside from King's Cross they did not visit any of the sites that were later attacked, suggesting that it wasn't a rehearsal of any kind. Nonetheless, one aspect of the two trips was exactly the same. What appears to be the same Jaguar was parked in the same spot, at the same time as some of the men arrived at Luton Station to catch a train to London. This Jaguar car and its occupants have never been mentioned by the authorities, so we can only assume that it has never been traced. The version of the Luton Station CCTV that was released at the inquests does not include frames from the camera that makes it clear that the Jaguar arrived in the 88 second gap. Instead, the inquests edit showed Lindsay moving his car from the perspective of the other end of the car park, so you cannot see the space nearby that the Jaguar parked in two minutes later. The strange editing of the CCTV from Luton, obscuring the Jaguar's arrival in two different ways in two different releases of the footage, only adds to the suspicion of a cover-up. The inquests did consider some evidence that there were others involved in the 7-7 plot. In the last few weeks before 7-7, there were several phone calls from Pakistan to the mobile phones connected to alleged 7-7 ringleader Mohammed Sadiq Khan. The calls were all incoming, the records never show Khan placing a call to Pakistan, the calls were placed in public phone boxes in Rawalpindi, and so they were never traced. The last call from Pakistan was made on the afternoon of 7-7, after the explosions. Despite this being the weakest evidence of a wider conspiracy, it was the only evidence considered in that way by the 7-7 inquests. The counsel for the inquests, Hugo Keith, put it to a police officer that the purpose of the calls was to provide help and guidance on building the bombs. The officer replied, yes, I think they had to be, sir. The mainstream media has widely repeated this story, but given that Khan's family were from Pakistan, and he had visited the country twice in the two years before 7-7, the calls could have been made for any number of reasons. By contrast, the testimony of Joseph Martokia was only ever presented in a way that supported the Home Office narrative. It was a highly charged moment, and it was witnessed by this man, neither Sue Clark nor Sylvia Waugh got much coverage at all. Though numerous independent media outlets followed the July 7th Truth campaign in talking about the mysterious Jaguar, it wasn't discussed at the inquests, and it has never been discussed by the mainstream media. London is one of the CCTV capitals of the world, and after 7-7 it was reported that the police had seized 80,000 video recordings. They initially released only three images. For three years these were the only pictures of the alleged bombers on 7-7, though the media have often made use of the 28th of June footage without clarifying that it is from a different day. The Dummy Run CCTV shows the men travelling to London and visiting various places, they get on and off tube trains and walk through stations. We have never seen the equivalent footage for 7-7, showing the alleged bombers approaching or boarding the targets. In October 2010, during the first days of the inquests, it was explained that the video doesn't exist due to a fault in the King's Cross system. The system allegedly malfunctioned, and for around 20 minutes, the exact period when the alleged bombers would have been travelling through the station, it was stuck on one camera. Truth campaigners and journalists had demanded the release of the 77 CCTV for years, with some success, but we had never been told before about the fault with the King's Cross system. This may be why the BBC chose to report that the hug witnessed by Joseph Martokia had been caught on camera, when authorities are now saying that the footage does not exist and could not have existed. There is plenty of footage of Haseeb Hussain wandering around the King's Cross area, but there is none showing him in the nearby McDonald's. 
We are told that the recorder in the shop was turned off shortly before Hussein entered. There are frames showing the number 91 bus he is alleged to have caught, but none showing Hussein on the bus. There are images of the outside of the number 30 bus that Hussein supposedly bombed, and video of people in buildings in Tavistock Square reacting to the explosion. There is no video from inside the bus, again due to a malfunctioning CCTV system. As such, at the start of the inquests they couldn't release much new CCTV footage to help bolster public opinion in favour of the official story. Instead, we were shown brief clips from each of the bomb sites. The clips were heavily edited and showed little useful information. One thing that is clear is that although the videos were apparently shot on the afternoon and evening of 7-7, there are no police investigators present. There is no obvious effort being made to preserve the crime scene for investigation or to gather evidence before it became contaminated or degraded. According to the Home Office narrative, it was on July 12th that the police first identified the four alleged bombers on the King's Cross CCTV footage. Later that day, they identified the same four men at Luton Station. The second ISC report was even more specific, saying that it was at 1pm on the 12th that Khan, Tanweer and Hussain were identified from the King's Cross CCTV. Later on the 12th, police watched the Luton CCTV and Lindsay became a suspect. There are three obvious questions. If only one camera at King's Cross was working in the 20 minutes before the explosions, then why did it take the police five days to review the video and find the clip of the four alleged bombers? If the police were that slow to find the King's Cross footage, then why did they view the CCTV from Luton so quickly? Why did they go directly to Luton, when at that stage they did not know where the alleged bombers had caught the train to King's Cross? One possibility is the account of Sue Clark, who says that she saw men putting on rucksacks at Luton Station car park. She was interviewed on the afternoon of July 12th, but she remembers as many as six men, not four. Further testimony at the inquests only posed more questions. Detective Inspector Kindness relayed the story that one of the officers that was reviewing the CCTV was ex-military. The officer saw the four men walking two by two through King's Cross and felt it was significant. When lawyers for the bereaved tried to press the issue, the detective explained that they chose Luton not because of Sue Clark's statement, but as a result of the sighting at King's Cross. They then followed the train up the line to Luton. Lady Justice Hallett commented, I think this is a fuss about nothing, but the situation only got more confused. The detective claimed that the police focused on Luton because of information received on the 11th of July, rather than the 12th as the government's reports claim. He was then shown a CCTV viewing log detailing how police had begun looking at footage from Luton on the 10th of July, and he confirmed that the information that led them to Luton was received on the 10th. This is two days before the government reports say that the police had identified the men at King's Cross, which makes no sense. If the police did not identify the four men until the 11th or 12th, then what were they doing looking at CCTV from Luton Station on the 10th? Did someone else tell them where to look? Several witnesses at the inquests have seen their testimony used as critical evidence of one or another theory of 7-7. In every case there are reasons to doubt whether their testimony supports any particular narrative. Fayaz Patel was an employee at King's Cross tube station on the morning of July 7, 2005. At the inquests he described how a man approached him that morning and asked to speak to the duty manager. When Patel explained that the duty manager was busy, the man insisted. Patel went off to find his supervisor, but by the time he got back, the man had disappeared. The man Patel described has been widely portrayed as Jermaine Lindsay in attempts to bolster the official or alternative narratives. But Patel was not at all certain that the man he saw was Lindsay. He described the man as smartly dressed, possibly with dreadlocks, and carrying a small rucksack. This doesn't in any way match the CCTV of Lindsay on the morning of 7-7. The Home Office narrative includes a seven-point list of key evidence proving that these were suicide attacks. The fifth point says, 
Witness accounts suggest two of the men were fiddling with their rucksacks shortly before the explosions. One of these witnesses was Richard Jones, who says that he saw a man on the bottom deck of the number 30 bus shortly before it blew up. Jones appeared on several news networks in the days after 7-7, and his description of an Asian man fiddling with his rucksack helped establish the notion of suicide bombers. There are various problems with Jones's story, as pointed out by a wide number of critics and skeptics of the official narrative. The man he says he saw was on the wrong deck of the bus. His descriptions of what the man was wearing have varied from interview to interview. He was called as a witness at the 7-7 inquests and told his story once again. Jones said, At no stage have I ever said that I actually saw the bomber, right? Hugo Keith commented, But your statement, I'm afraid, has been open to conjecture and surmise in the way of these things in the public domain. I want to bring in Richard Jones from London. Mr. Jones was actually riding that double-decker bus that was hit in the terror attack. Uh, he also saw the man that police believe was responsible. Good morning, Mr. Jones. Though Jones's account has been used by officials in the mainstream media, it appears he has now been dropped from the official story. His testimony had no bearing on the aims and concerns of the inquests, so it appears he was only called for the purpose of distancing him from the government's narrative. The other witness who remembers seeing one of the alleged bombers fiddling with his rucksack shortly before the explosion was Danny Biddle. He was a passenger on the Edgware Road train supposedly bombed by Mohammed Sadiq Khan. He was badly injured in the explosion and was in a coma for several weeks after 7-7. Biddle reported how he remembered that he had seen Khan on the train after seeing his face on the news. His testimony at the inquests is in most respects at odds with the government narrative. The man he remembers was sat down with a small black camping rucksack on his lap. Biddle recalls how the man looked up at him and then made a movement with his hand that triggered the explosion. But no mechanism for the explosion has ever been found and the police and Home Office narrative have always maintained that the rucksacks were on the floor. It is entirely possible that none of these three witnesses, along with Joseph Martokia, saw anything of any significance on 7-7. Elements of what they've said have been woven into elaborate conspiracy theories, both official and alternative, with little regard to detail or context. While Richard Jones was quietly and respectfully written out of the official narrative, another man was not so lucky. Martin Gilbertson is a former Hells Angel turned IT consultant, who worked at the Ikra bookshop. In 2007, he was widely interviewed. Gilbertson claimed that he knew Mohammed Sadiq Khan and Shazad Tanweer and others at the bookshop that he considered radicals or fanatics. He says that his work at the bookshop was not just fixing computers, but making copies of Islamist films and literature. Gilbertson says that he was so concerned that he approached the police with CDs of evidence and was told to post them to West Yorkshire Police. He says he did this in October 2003, but never heard anything back about it. This has been portrayed as a missed opportunity to stop the 7-7 plot, but in his inquest testimony Gilbertson said many things that weren't true. Though the legal teams missed several of Gilbertson's untruths, they picked up on enough that he was accused of having made the whole thing up. West Yorkshire Police today, through their barrister, said to him, there was not a single bit of evidence to support this allegation and they called him and i quote an egocentric self-publicist fantasist exaggerator speculator and an irresponsible individual as is common with eyewitnesses many of those who testified at the inquests were unsure what had happened how when and why the issues with the testimony of danny biddle and joseph martokia have been overlooked as their accounts help support the official narrative the uncertainties in Fayaz Patel's account have been overlooked by those on the official and alternative sides who claim to know the truth about what happened. The problems with Richard Jones's story are such that he was called to the inquest specifically to dissociate him from the official story. The tale of Martin Gilbertson, which implies a missed opportunity to stop the attacks, ended with the authorities accusing him of being a liar.
The official narrative says that the explosions were caused by homemade improvised explosive devices mixed at the bomb factory in Alexandra Grove, Leeds, and then packed into rucksacks. They were then carried to the targets by the four alleged bombers, set down on the floors of the trains and bus, and manually detonated in intentional suicide attacks. There are several major problems with this story, which is perhaps the most fundamental aspect of the official narrative. First, no mechanism for initiating the explosions was found at any of the bomb sites. No switches, no buttons, no triggers. A 9-volt battery was found at Tavistock Square and some wiring found at Edgware Road and Oldgate. A small device not revealed in the public inquest exhibits was found at the supposed bomb factory. It was composed of a halogen light bulb, wiring and HMTD wrapped in tin foil. Forensic Explosives Laboratory expert Dr Clifford Todd concluded that this was the bomb initiator. However, the single battery that they found only showed signs of possible explosion damage. Though the wiring did show signs of being at the centre of the explosion, it was only found at two scenes, and wiring of this type is commonly used, particularly in headphones. When the police located the Nissan Micro in Luton Station car park, they subjected it to several controlled explosions. They found numerous items inside the car, including an additional rucksack, cool boxes, freezer blocks, several large batteries, light bulbs, duct tape, and several tools. They also found what appear to be handheld bombs and fuses. The authorities would have us believe that the men chose to rent a Nissan Micra, one of the smallest cars available in Britain, to carry the three men and large quantities of explosive and bomb-making equipment down to Luton from Leeds. They would also have us believe that after arriving in Luton, the four men assembled their bombs in the boot of the car, in full view of members of the public and CCTV cameras. So, why the extra rucksack? Why the additional batteries and light bulbs? If the smaller bombs were intended for personal defence, why did they leave them behind? The only man that was forensically linked to the objects in the micro was Mohammed Sadiq Khan, and he was linked to mundane items, like sweet wrappers, plastic carrier bags, and a water bottle. There was a similar story at the supposed bomb factory. The police found various items that could have been used to construct bombs, including numerous plastic tubs containing a chemical mixture of hydrogen peroxide and piperine, a substance found in pepper. This is claimed to be the main charge of the explosive, but there were two different kinds of the sludge, a lighter coloured type and a darker coloured type. They tested the various sludges, and in only one instance found that the material had explosive properties. Though they found hundreds of fingerprints in the Alexandra Grove flat, none of the plastic tubs of sludge were linked to any of the four alleged bombers by fingerprint or DNA evidence. Haseeb Hussain's fingerprints were found on one container, which they said contained HMTD. Were the bombs made in the alleged bomb factory? If so, then were other people involved in making them? If not, then where were they made? Over time, we have been told a variety of stories about what the bombs were made of. In the initial days after the attacks, it was unanimously reported that military explosives were used in the bombings, though this story changed after the discovery of the alleged bomb factory. Since then, a variety of peroxide-based explosive mixtures have been proposed, from TATP to HMTD, mixed with piperine from black pepper or powdered masala spice. In the history of improvised explosives, this chemical mixture is unique. At the 7-7 inquests, Clifford Todd confirmed that at the Piccadilly line scene they found no battery, no wiring, and no trace of either the initiator, supposedly HMTD, or the main explosive, a mixture of peroxide and piperine. Traces of HMTD were found at the other three sites, but in such small quantities that it was impossible to say where they came from. No trace or residue of the main explosive was found at any of the explosion sites. As such, there is no chemical evidence connecting the explosions in London to the items found in the Nissan Micra in Luton, or the items in the alleged bomb factory in Leeds. In the absence of such evidence, the case against the four alleged bombers rests on their bodies being found at the scenes, with indications that they were at the centre of the explosions when the bombs went off. Once again, there are significant problems. No internal post-mortems were carried out on any of the bodies that were found at the scenes. 
This means that there was no detailed mapping of the internal injuries suffered in the explosions, which is crucial in determining where people were relative to the bombs. The Metropolitan Police had to rely on eyewitness accounts to create diagrams showing where in the carriages the explosions took place and where the victims were at the time. The evidence presented at the inquests was far from conclusive. At Liverpool Street, the narrative says that Forensic evidence suggests that Tan Weir was sitting towards the back of the second carriage, with the rucksack next to him on the floor. But the police diagram shows the explosion going off in the standing area near the rear of the carriage, not by a seat. The eyewitness Bruce Late, who was in the carriage at the time of the explosion, says that this is where he saw a crater in the floor of the carriage. In a widely read interview, Late described metal twisted upwards as though the bomb was underneath the train and said that he doesn't remember a person or a bag in that area before the explosion. Late was called before the inquests as a witness, but wasn't asked if he remembered seeing Tanweer in that location. Another survivor, Michael Henning, was also called. He was in the front of the next carriage along, and in his testimony he described seeing someone sat where the narrative says Tanweer was. He described the man in very vague terms, saying, I couldn't say with great detail his features, etc. It's more those soft focus of the people you normally see on the tube and haven't paid attention to. His description of the man doesn't match up with the CCTV of Tan Weir on that day, and so Henning did not in any way positively identify Tan Weir. Also, William Walsh, the man who was apparently sat where Henning says he saw someone, suffered only minor injuries. If Tanweer was where the police say he was, then Walsh shouldn't be alive to tell his tale. A further witness from Oldgate, an off-duty police officer called Elizabeth Kenworthy, was also in the adjacent carriage. She crawled through to help the injured and saved people's lives. She drew a sketch of what she found in the carriage. It shows significant damage to the floor in front of where the narrative says Tanweer was sat, but the police say William Walsh was sat. Kenworthy's sketch also shows a large hole in the standing area, where the police say that the explosion took place, which largely confirms Bruce Lake's account. It also notes another hole in the side of the carriage, but on the opposite side, and further up. There are similar issues with the Piccadilly line blast. The narrative says that forensic evidence suggests that the explosion occurred on or close to the floor of the standing area, between the second and third set of seats, the narrative does not say where Lindsay was in the carriage, only that it is unlikely that he was seated. It goes on to say that due to the carriage being crowded with 127 people, it is difficult to position those involved. The police diagram entered into evidence at the inquests only includes 112 people. Though it shows the explosion essentially where the narrative says that it was, it does not include the locations of any of the people that were killed, including Jermaine Lindsay. Officially, 27 people, including Lindsay, died on the Piccadilly Line train. The narrative's number of 127 people in the carriage implies that there were also 100 survivors, not 112 as the police diagram shows. Other diagrams suggest an explosion further towards the rear of the carriage. One sketch drawn by the station supervisor at Russell Square Station shows a hole in the floor and in the roof further back, between the last rows of seats. Another police diagram detailing the positions of the dead at the start of the recovery process shows Lindsay's body at the very back of the carriage, several metres away from the explosion and where most of the victims were found. A further sketch, and testimony from Detective Inspector Brunsden, shows areas marked X, Y and Z. Area Z is where Brunsden says that he found Lindsay's body and various documents identifying Lindsay. This suggests a highly implausible scenario for the Piccadilly Line bombing that goes something like this. Lindsay muscled his way into a packed tube carriage, dropped numerous papers and ID, pushed his way past a row of seats and into the middle of the carriage, took off his rucksack, put it on the floor and blew himself up. This somehow caused a crater not just in the standing area, but between the rows of seats further back. Lindsay's body somehow ended up several metres away, despite numerous people standing in the space in between, and no one in the carriage saw Lindsay even once. The evidence about the Edgware Road bombing doesn't make much sense either. The narrative says that Mohammed Sadiq Khan was likely near the standing area by the first set of double doors. He was probably also seated with the bomb next to him on the floor. 
The police diagram reflects this ambiguity, showing Khan sat down, but showing the explosion happening in the standing area. The distance between Khan and the explosion implies that he would have had to not only put his rucksack on the floor, but push it away from him before setting off the bomb. Police Constable Potter attended the scene and drew a diagram showing the crater even more centrally, too far away from where Khan was sitting for it to have been a manual detonation. Other witness testimony and exhibits suggest that there were in fact several holes blown in the floor of the carriage. The driver, Ray Whitehurst, and a passenger, Danny Belston, both described a hole up at the front of the carriage. John MacDonald, a passenger at the rear of the carriage, testified how he had moved towards the injured after the explosion. He testified how he fell down a hole in the floor, between the rows of seats, in front of seats 25 and 26. His diagram also shows ripped metal and a hole blasted in the door in the standing area, but this is not where the police diagram shows the hole. The first hole MacDonald mentioned was directly in front of John Tullock, the man in this well-known picture. Tullock described a hole fairly close to his right, in the standing area. This is also what he told the BBC. But this is at odds with the police diagram, which shows the centre of the explosion on the other side of the standing area from where Tullock was sat. When one of the inquest lawyers queried him further on the location of the hole, he said, it seemed to me to be closer than that red cross. The lawyer replied, Professor, don't worry about the X, because we've heard evidence from some witnesses that suggests there's other disruption and potentially other holes in the floor as well as the bomb crater, so it may in fact be a different hole that you're referring to. A further witness, Bill Mann, had his statement read into evidence at the inquests. The sketch he drew showed a hole on the other side of the carriage from where he was sat, in the standing area one row of seats to his right. But the police diagram and his statement has Bill Mann as person number 30, meaning that the hole he described and drew would be here, in the next standing area back from where the explosion is meant to have happened. From the various descriptions, it appears as many as five or more holes were blown in the floor of the carriage at Edgware Road. At least four of them were too far away from where Khan was supposedly sitting for him to have caused them by manually detonating a bomb. Indeed, the only reason why Khan is placed where he is in the police diagram is the testimony of Danny Biddle, whose account does not fit with the official story. There are different issues with the explosion on the number 30 bus. The narrative says that Hussein sat on the upper deck, towards the back. Forensic evidence suggests that the bomb was next to him in the aisle, or between his feet on the floor. A man fitting Hussein's description was seen on the lower deck earlier, fiddling repeatedly with his rucksack. The witness who saw a man fiddling with his rucksack on the lower deck was Richard Jones, who by the time of the inquests had been shown to be an extremely unreliable witness. The police diagram at the time of the bombing shows Hussein where the narrative says he was, and all the photographs and video show the aftermath of an explosion in this location. But what places Hussein there, and therefore suggests that he was responsible? The only witness cited in the narrative has since been quietly dissociated from the official story. The other witness accounts are similarly problematic. Hussein is said to have caught the number 91 bus up to Euston, and then caught the number 30, which was diverted to Tavistock Square. Two witnesses at the inquests described seeing a man fitting Hussein's description on the number 91 bus. They described him as appearing lost and anxious, and behaving very oddly. He was apparently bashing into other passengers with his large rucksack. Now that Richard Jones has been axed, the only witness to Hussein's presence on the number 30 bus is Lisa French, who was called to testify at the inquests. However, her description is at odds with those of the witnesses on the number 91 bus, and with aspects of the official story. She described how she got on the number 30 at Euston, and as she was talking to the driver, several other people got on. She said that some people knocked her shoulder or laptop bag as they passed her, but that one man with a rucksack took the trouble to take it off so that he didn't hit her. This behaviour is completely contrary to that observed by the witnesses on the number 91 bus, suggesting that there were two different men with rucksacks on the two different buses. Lisa French then followed the man upstairs and found a seat, as she indicated on this sketch of the bus. The man with the bag headed towards the very back row and sat down there. Other witnesses from the top deck of the number 30, Gary O'Monohan and Camille Scott, also described an Asian-looking man walking to or seated at the rear of the bus. The problem with this is that there was another man of Asian appearance, dressed in a superficially similar way to Hussein, 
also carrying a bag, who was sitting at the rear of the bus. Prevshan Vihendran, who is Sri Lankan, was sat in the middle seat of the back row of the bus, according to the police diagram. Strangely, the BBC's version of the police diagram includes someone sat in that position, but does not identify them. Did the witnesses see Haseeb Hussain or Prevshan Vihendran? The question was not asked at the inquests. Indeed, Lisa French did not positively identify the man she saw as Haseeb Hussain, and described the bag he was carrying as a big backpack, and then as a laptop rucksack that he could carry on one shoulder, saying, It was quite large, sort of square, so I think that's why I thought it was a laptop bag rather than a camping rucksack. She has suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, and when asked about her recollections by the BBC, she replied that she couldn't remember much from before the explosion. And what happened when the uh, bomber got onto the bus? I don't really have any recollection of the blast myself because I was knocked unconscious, so um, my recollection of events really start from the moment that, that I re regain consciousness on, on the wreck bus. None of the witnesses closest to where the police say Hussein was remember him being there. The witnesses who remember someone who could have been Hussein described someone who is at least equally likely to have been Prevshan Vihendran. The police displayed another diagram at the inquests showing where the bodies of dead people were found after the explosion. The bodies said to be Hussein's can be seen covered in a blue blanket in this photograph. Two witnesses at the inquests did describe a body in this area. No witness described initially finding the body or covering it with a blanket. There is no record of the body being pronounced dead at the scene, and no explanation has been given as to how it was identified as Hussein's. Indeed, none of the four alleged bombers were pronounced dead at any of the four scenes. The doctor who was sent to the Liverpool Street and Edgware Road sites was a consultant psychiatrist, Dr Morgan Costello. He explained how he was very much led by the scene manager, and that he identified and pronounced dead six bodies at Edgware Road, and seven bodies at Liverpool Street. The pronouncements of life extinct made on the Piccadilly line and at Tavistock Square were of only a single person in each case. This means that of a total of 56 deaths, only 15 were pronounced dead at the scenes. Although identifying who has died is one of the fundamental and legally obligatory functions of an inquest, the process by which the victims were identified was ruled to be outside of the scope of these proceedings by Coroner Lady Justice Hallett. According to the inquest testimony, the investigators only found small pieces of the bodies of Khan and Tanweer, some scraps of muscle tissue in Khan's case and a piece of Tanweer's spine, and these were identified by DNA analysis. According to the testimony of a forensic anthropologist, Julianne Roberts, she examined the remains to try to determine where the men were in relation to the bombs. Strangely, she described the remains of Khan and Tanweer as far more complete and intact than the small pieces identified via DNA. This process had never been carried out before and in an investigation in Britain. Though Hugo Keith tried to beef up Ms Roberts' authority, she admitted that she was not qualified to distinguish between degrees of explosive damage to parts of the body. Nonetheless, she concluded that the injuries sustained to the reassembled bodies that she examined were consistent with those suffered by suicide bombers. While most of the questions asked in this film and elsewhere weren't asked at the inquests, the issue of whether MI5 could have stopped the bombings was a central concern. However, as with many similar events, the question has been what did they know and when did they know it, rather than what were they doing and why were they doing it. Were the intelligence services charged with protecting national security asleep on the watch? A closer examination shows that the four alleged bombers were surrounded by people who were either being investigated by the security services before 7-7, or were working for them. There have been several alleged masterminds of 7-7, named and shamed in the international media, but never prosecuted. The most well-known is Harun Aswat, who for weeks after the bombings was widely reported to be the brains behind the attacks. He was arrested in Zambia and brought to Britain, where he has been imprisoned for several years awaiting extradition to America to face charges there. He has also been described as a double agent, working for MI6. But if either of these allegations are true, or indeed both of them, then why is he languishing in a maximum security prison? No evidence has ever been presented connecting him to either 7-7 or to MI6, so as far as we know he is completely innocent. 
Was there someone else using the name Harun Azwat who was in contact with the alleged bombers? Another man of that name was arrested in Pakistan shortly after 7-7, though nothing more is known about him. The Ikra Bookshop and Learning Centre in Leeds has been one of the main focal points for the discussion about intelligence failures. Both Mohammed Sadiq Khan and Shahzad Tanweer were involved at the bookshop and it has been portrayed as a hotbed of Islamic radicalism. Martin Gilbertson, who worked for the bookshop as an IT consultant, said that in 2003 he became so concerned about what was going on there that he wrote to West Yorkshire Police. Well, in 2003 I sent them some discs that had been produced by the uh, bookshop in Beeston, which was very anti-Western, um, anti-Iraq, anti-everything. The police say that they have no record of Gilbertson contacting them, and Gilbertson has said many things that weren't true. However, the question of whether Gilbertson did contact them is irrelevant, as they had been aware of people involved at the bookshop for years beforehand. A primary figure in this story is Martin McDade, a former special boat service and counter-terrorism operative who became a convert to Islam. According to Gilbertson and others at the bookshop, McDade was the one who was whipping up hatred. He was showing videos of apparently extremist material and generally acting like a radical. McDade had first come to the attention of the authorities in 1998, according to a document from the inquests. In January 2001, they carried out a surveillance operation codenamed Warlock, where they filmed McDade and others on a camping trip to the Lake District, another supposed terrorism training camp. Among those caught on camera was Mohammed Sadiq Khan. There was further surveillance of McDade in April 2003, during Operation Honeysuckle. The security services saw McDade get a lift in a car that belonged to Mohammed Sadiq Khan. Though Khan was apparently assessed to be of no significance, they followed up on the surveillance with inquiries into the Ikra bookshop, where Khan was a trustee. McDade left the UK not long after 7-7 and was last heard of working in Oman as an English teacher. His role in the Ikra bookshop and his influence on the alleged 7-7 bombers has never been properly examined, least of all by the inquests. Though his name surfaced a few times in relation to the alleged bombers, the serious questions were never asked. Who was McDade? Did he really convert from being a special forces soldier into a radical Muslim? Was he an informant or provocateur? If the alleged bombers were responsible for 7-7, then did McDade play a role in radicalising them? Was this a covert operation that got out of control? Was it done deliberately? According to the Intelligence and Security Committee's second report, in early 2003, MI5 received information that Mohammed Koyum Khan was an Al-Qaeda facilitator. They launched an investigation, codenamed Operation Crevice, in late March 2003. In July 2003, they came across a phone number that they had not seen before and checked it out. The report says that checks reveal that the telephone number in question is registered to Sadiq Khan of 49A Bude Road, Leeds, the address of the Ikra bookshop. The ISC went on to say that MI5 cannot match the name Sadiq Khan with any of their databases and the contact is not investigated further since there is nothing to suggest involvement in any terrorism-related activity. This is complete nonsense. A security service document from the inquests showed that the check on the phone took place on the 11th of March 2003. According to the ISC, this is months before they even knew that the phone was being used to call Qayyum Khan, so where did they get the number from? It is also before late March, when Operation Crevice officially began. Furthermore, if they did check on the name Sadiq Khan in July 2003, then the name should have come up as the owner of a car that they had connected to Martin McDade in April of that year. Eventually, Operation Crevice uncovered what is widely known as the fertilizer bomb plot. The suspects were arrested in March 2004 and went on trial after 7-7. During the trial, it emerged that one of the fertilizer bomb suspects, Omar Khayyam, had met with Mohammed Sadiq Khan and Shahzad Tanweer in Britain. MI5 had recorded them talking about terrorism. So are you really a terrorist? They're working with us. You're serious? You, you are basically? I'm not a terrorist, but they're working through us. Who are? There's no one higher than you. They had even taken photos of Khan and Tanweer and followed them in a car to Leeds, where they got Khan's home address. 
yet still they claim that they did not identify him. The fertiliser bomb plot itself was piecemeal and unclear. The men had been bugged talking about terrorism, but their conversations never mentioned a specific target or plan of attack. The alleged ringleader of the plot, Omar Khayyam, did buy a large quantity of fertiliser and stored it in a lockup, but it was quickly replaced by the police with a harmless compound. When it came to the trial, Khayyam described how he had received terrorism training in Pakistan in a camp run by the Pakistani security service, the ISI. Days later, he refused to answer any further questions as he said the ISI had threatened his family. His silence makes it difficult to know how much of a plot there really was. The prosecution evidence included a confession by one of the suspects, Salahuddin Amin, who was arrested in Pakistan. He says that he was tortured and that his confession when he returned to Britain was forced, caused by the duress of his treatment in Pakistan. One man who was conspicuously absent from the trial was Mohammed Koyum Khan. Even though he was apparently the reason why the security services began Operation Crevice in the first place, he was never arrested. He was referred to throughout the trial, but only by the codename Q. He was never called as a witness by either the prosecution or the defence, suggesting that he may have been a confidential informant. Who was or is Q? There are a lot of people connected to this investigation. Some of them I know their identities, some of them I don't. Um, but you know who Q is? I know who Q is, but I'm not going to discuss uh, who he is or what he is or what he does uh, during this interview. When the BBC tracked him down, they met with strong resistance to being interviewed. The key prosecution witness was Mohammed Janaid Babar, a Pakistani American who was living in Queens, New York when the 9 11 attacks happened. Babar's mother worked in and escaped from the World Trade Center, but instead of hating the terrorists who nearly killed his mother, Babar apparently decided to join them. He flew to Pakistan where he made a big show of his commitment to militancy. There is no negotiation with the Americans when they're coming in with the mindset to kill my Muslim brothers and sisters. I will do the same on the front line. I will kill every American that I see in Afghanistan. And while I'm in Pakistan, if I see them in Pakistan, I'll kill every American soldier I can in Pakistan. He became an Al-Qaeda facilitator and set up a training camp in Malakand that he says was visited by both Mohammed Sadiq Khan and Omar Khayyam. Babar said at the Operation Crevice trial that it was Q who had sent Khan to Pakistan. Babar visited the UK several times, meeting with various people including Mohammed Sadiq Khan and Omar Khayyam. He came and went freely, apparently unmonitored by the security services, despite his open admission of being willing to commit murder. Shortly after the Operation Crevice arrests, he flew back to America in April 2004. He wasn't arrested when he landed, but gave himself up to the authorities only days later. He became the Al-Qaeda Supergrass, testifying at the Crevice trial in the UK, an associated trial in Canada, and both trials of the alleged 7-7 co-conspirators. Babar's role in the fertilizer bomb plot was to organize explosives training, though he also purchased the aluminium powder that could be used to turn the fertiliser into an explosive. A combination of Babar's testimony, Amin's forced confession, Khayyam's refusal to testify, and Q's absence from the trial, resulted in five convictions in the UK and one in Canada. They were given life sentences, but Babar got off much more lightly. While the inquests were taking place, a hearing in New York sentenced Babar to time served. He had spent less than five years in prison and served only two years of supervised release. The court documents reveal that his extraordinary cooperation had begun even before his arrest in April 2004. Some suspect that he was an undercover agent all along. Every time I hear that Barber has been released or he, early or he was on bail for two years and so has been wandering the streets of America free, in fact I hear he's now that he's now married with children himself, fills me with anger because it points to complicity with the American Secret Service in his role in Pakistan. This suspicion is borne out by the fact that, like Martin McDade, 
The bar had been known to the security services for years. An unsealed court document says that he first became known to the authorities when he joined Al Muhajirun in New York in the year 2000. After his arrest, Babar was shown pictures taken by the British security services during the Operation Crevice surveillance. One picture showed Mohammed Sadiq Khan and Shazad Tanweer, but it had been harshly cropped and badly copied, and Babar did not recognise either man. The picture is so bad, it is almost as if MI5 did not want them to be identified. I think they could have made a better effort. They could have stuck it on a jumbo jet and got it there overnight if they really wanted to. They could have sent it over with a member of the security services or the Metropolitan Police. The inquests dealt with these issues mostly by not mentioning them. For everything else, there was Witness G. This was the only witness that MI5 put forward to answer questions at the inquests, and it was an almost complete waste of time. Witness G is, we are told, the Chief of Staff to the head of MI5. Chief of Staff is a largely political and administrative role, not an operational one, and so Witness G was not in a position to answer most of the questions about intelligence issues raised at the inquests. Graham Fulkes, the father of one of the victims, expressed his concerns to the BBC. He admitted that he's... Um he wasn't in post in 2005 and that he's not an, uh, um, an anti-terrorist, Islamic anti-terrorist expert and that he was relying on other people telling him information and him reading notes. So effectively, hearsay evidence, which is not normally allowed in the judicial process. Just as MI5 had done with the two Intelligence and Security Committee inquiries, the excuses given were generic and meaningless. After most major terrorist attacks, there are allegations of intelligence failures, but this has several results that play into the hands of the authorities. It reinforces the official story. If the four alleged bombers were not responsible for the attacks, then MI5 cannot be blamed for failing to stop them. If you have the leader of the biggest and most, most lethal terror plot in London's history under surveillance, and then you let him slip through your fingers, that can only be classified as a massive intelligence failure. It provides a reason to give more money and other resources to the intelligence services. The budget for British intelligence and security services has increased dramatically since 7-7, though of course we are told that the threat remains as big, scary, real and serious as ever. The threat today may be at its most heightened state since the attacks nearly 10 years ago. It provides an excuse for an increase in the technological capabilities of the security services. More CCTV, more intrusive surveillance, more databases. The implication is always that if only they had access to more information, then they might have been able to prevent an atrocity. The main thing is, are our intelligence services as jacked up as they can be uh, to fight counter-terror? And the answer from all this is no way. It provides a justification for fear-mongering. The suggestion is that if only they had been more paranoid, then they might have followed up on some of these characters and stopped the bombings. The entire discussion about intelligence failures only serves to advance the agenda of the real terrorists, the ones who are constantly talking about the threat. We face a terrorist threat in this country. This is a new threat, a new type of threat. The threat we face from extremist terror. In reality, if the alleged bombers were responsible, then MI5 had more than enough information to recognise them as legitimate targets. So was the failure deliberate? Did MI5 know more than they've admitted? One piece of evidence from the inquest strongly suggests that this is the case. Both Mohammed Sadiq Khan and Shahzad Tanweer visited Pakistan in the years before 7-7. The Pakistani authorities have a system called Pisces, which has a searchable database of everyone entering and leaving the country through the normal channels. After 7-7, the Metropolitan Police sent a request to Pakistan to search Pisces for details of Mohammed Sadiq Khan's visits to the country. According to a document and inquest testimony, the request was sent on August 1st, around four weeks after 7-7. A response came back on August 22nd, detailing Khan's movements in and out of Pakistan. But details of Khan and Tanweer's visits had appeared in newspapers weeks earlier. The only logical place for them to have got the information was the security services, but officially the police didn't have the information until over a month after the media reported it. Did MI5 know all along about Khan and Tanweer's trips to Pakistan, but didn't tell the police? 
If the alleged bombers were not responsible for the attacks, then someone set them up to look like terrorists. I'm sure by now the media's painted a suitable picture of me. At every point that they connected up to a wider network of Islamic radicalism or militancy, they connected to it through a probable or known double agent. What does this imply about who could have set them up, and who was really responsible for the attacks? In the absence of evidence showing who was responsible for 7-7, we must ask, why do so many people believe that they know who was responsible? This question applies to every theory about 7-7, both the official narrative and alternative narratives. The vast majority of the public believe one or another story about what happened. The biggest reason that people believe the official story is the mainstream media, who have endlessly repeated that narrative almost since day one. Over and over they tell us that Khan, Tanweer, Hussein and Lindsay blew themselves up and killed 52 people. The biggest reason that people believe in a different story is the alternative media, who have widely repeated their favoured narratives almost since day one. They often claim that Khan, Tanweer, Hussein and Lindsay were patsies, who believed that they were taking part in a terrorism training exercise. However, it isn't just media coverage after the event that has led the public to believe certain conspiracy theories about 7-7. Many real historical events, works of fiction, and terrorism simulations either predicted or foreshadowed 7-7, and conditioned people to have a certain response once the attacks took place. We have been told that 7-7 was Britain's first suicide bombing, and indeed the first suicide bombing in Western Europe. But over a year before 7-7, Terrorists bombed the Madrid subway, killing 191 people and injuring over 2,000. Weeks later, as the authorities closed in on some of the suspects, four of the terrorists blew themselves up, killing themselves and one Spanish Special Forces soldier. Was this Western Europe's first terrorist suicide bombing? No. That dubious honour goes to a French anarchist, Marshal Bourdin, who blew himself up in Greenwich Park in 1894. The circumstances of his death are shrouded in mystery and speculation, but what is known is that he was carrying a small bomb, apparently headed towards the Greenwich Observatory, when the bomb went off. He was seriously injured, and was taken to hospital, and died half an hour later. He did not explain what had happened, where he was going, or what he was trying to do. Bordan was found with gold coins in his pockets, and a card bearing the name of the Autonomy Club, the central hub for anarchists in London. A police raid on the club resulted in numerous arrests, but no one else was ever charged in connection with the explosion. Newspapers reported that Bourdin had been under police surveillance. In the days after the bombing, in the House of Commons, MP Charles Darling pressed for a verdict of suicide. At that time, suicide was illegal, and such a verdict would have seen Bourdin's property seized by the Crown, and the government privately disposing of his body. In the event, at his funeral there was a large demonstration, and violent clashes between anarchists and the police. Days later, the inquest into Bourdin's death returned a verdict of fellow de se, or suicide. There was no evidence that Bourdin intended to kill himself, and the money in his pockets suggested that he intended to survive. Many people did not believe the official story about Bourdin's death. As shown by the case of the Walsall anarchists, the movement was riddled with spies. One such spy was Bourdin's brother-in-law, H.B. Samuels. In an adaptation of the Bourdin story by Joseph Conrad, called The Secret Agent, Conrad portrayed the bombing as an attempt by Samuels to blow up the Greenwich Observatory. In Conrad's story, the Bourdin character dies by accident, tripping over en route to the observatory. Others portrayed the event differently. Patrick McIntyre, the special branch constable turned whistleblower, wrote about the Greenwich Park explosion in his memoirs. According to McIntyre's informants, Bourdin was delivering the bomb to two foreign anarchists who left Britain on the night of the explosion. Like Conrad, McIntyre's account suggests that Bourdin's death was an accident. John Walsh, another policeman who published his memoirs in a newspaper, told a different story. His informants told him that at a meeting at the Autonomy Club, someone had accused Bourdin of being a spy. Bourdin set out to prove his commitment to the anarchist cause, and once again accidentally ended up killing himself. The parallels with 7-7 are obvious, 
but one more retelling of the Bourdin story was eerily prescient. In 1936, an Alfred Hitchcock film called Sabotage fictionalised Bourdin's death. In the film, a man in London is directed by a foreign agent to carry out a bombing, but he is closely monitored by an undercover policeman. He manipulates his younger brother-in-law into carrying the bomb, though the boy believes he is just delivering a film reel. The target is a tube station, but the boy dawdles and gets distracted on his way there. He catches a bus to try and deliver the package on time, but the clock runs out and the bomb explodes, destroying the bus and killing everyone on it. The tale of Marshal Bourdin preempted 7-7 in various ways and provokes some relevant questions. Was Bourdin a suicide bomber, in the sense of intentionally blowing himself up? Was he an unintentional suicide bomber, blowing himself up by accident? Was he an unwilling suicide bomber, coerced into carrying the bomb, like the Irish proxy bombers? Was he an unwitting suicide bomber, who didn't even know that he was carrying a bomb? Was he something else? The same questions can be asked of an event that was in some ways predicted by Hitchcock's film. In 1996, 60 years after the release of Sabotage, a red London bus blew up in Oldwich. The police found out that one of the injured passengers was Irish and initially suspected that he was responsible. Days later, they realised that the only person to have died in the explosion was also Irish and it is now widely believed that he was carrying a bomb and that it went off prematurely. Just as Hitchcock's film foresaw the Old Witch bus bombing, the events of 7-7 were widely predicted. These precursors took place consistently in the years before 7-7, in the form of films, TV shows and training exercises. Whether intentionally or otherwise, they had the cumulative effect of conditioning people so that when the bombings took place, the public believed they knew what had happened and who was responsible. In June 2002, an episode of the popular BBC spy drama Spooks showed MI5 simulating an attack on a train station in London. The target was Broad Street Station, which has been disused since the 1980s, its functions taken over by Liverpool Street, one of the targets on 7-7. In the show, MI5 agents fake an attack so they can persuade an Irish terrorist group that their attempted bombing was successful and to deceive their own supervisor into thinking that they are trying to stop the attack. Are we running an MI5 inside MI5 here? A year later, another Spooks episode portrayed a Muslim suicide bombing in Britain. This was the first depiction of such an event on British television. In the show, a young boy is manipulated by a radical cleric into carrying out the bombing, and an Algerian double agent working for MI5 tries and fails to stop it from happening. Weeks later, on July 7, 2003, exactly two years before 7-7, another Spooks episode featured a bomb attack on London at the same time as a security service training exercise. I don't want to, but... Well, if this isn't a drill... As it turned out, the attack was simulated as part of the exercise. Exactly two months later, a terrorism training exercise codenamed OSIRIS-2 took place at Bank Underground Station. The scenario involved a chemical explosion, but the exercise took place on a Sunday in closely controlled conditions. It provided little by way of preparation for a real attack, and was criticised for provoking fear. Uh, I've heard OSIRIS described as a very expensive photo opportunity. Now, I'm not so cynical as to say that's the case, but... In February 2004, the BBC broadcast the pilot episode of a new show called Crisis Command, where members of the public took on the role of crisis response managers. The crises they dealt with included power surges, an attack on Waterloo Underground Station, and a plane crashing into the Houses of Parliament. In March 2004, the train bombings in Madrid took place. In May 2004, an episode of the BBC show Panorama involved a panel of experts responding to a fictional terrorist attack. This is the kind of terrorist attack the government repeatedly says is going to happen. The scenario involved bombings on three tube trains and then a bombing on a large road vehicle. One member of the expert panel was former counter-terrorism police officer turned management consultant Peter Power. The show was criticised by the government for scaring the public. 
On the very same day, authorities in New York carried out a terrorism training exercise called Operation Transit Safe that also featured attacks on underground trains. And you had 300, over 300 people that were injured and or killed because of those bombs that went off. In July 2004, a training exercise in Birmingham called Operation Horizon was based around suicide terrorists spraying the public with a chemical poison. Again, it was criticised for whipping up fear. In September 2004, the BBC broadcast a film it had co-produced with HBO called Dirty War. The film began with a terrorism training exercise and depicted a Muslim suicide attack using a radiological dirty bomb on Liverpool Street Station. It also showed a second pair of bombers being shot dead by police marksmen. In December 2004, another episode of Spooks portrayed a Muslim proxy bomb. An Iraqi woman is coerced into having explosives surgically implanted in her body by a terrorist who plans to detonate the explosives remotely. At the last minute, the terrorist is shot dead by special forces. Several years later, it was reported that intelligence services believed that Al-Qaeda were using bombs installed in breast implants, though this appears to be completely untrue. You can put a significant amount of Viome, uh, easily 15 to 20 ounces of fluid or gel, in both sides. In April 2005, an international training drill called Atlantic Blue again featured attacks on London tube trains and buses. The exercise also involved the United States, who called it Top Off 3, and Canada, who called it Triple Play. For the American exercise, a virtual news network produced fake news broadcasts reporting on the simulated attack. The news even included a fake terrorist suspect. In June 2005, another Spooks episode was filmed that portrayed an attack on a London tube station. The bomb this morning. Was it the Muslims? It broadcast on September 12th and once again showed a terrorist being shot dead by the authorities. It also featured thinly disguised references to the very real state-sponsored terrorism operation known as Gladio. The principle of Amiga. What about it? Stage terrorist provocations in Europe which would justify a government crackdown. I think we did rather well. On June 12th, yet another training exercise was held based around an emergency at a London tube station, this time at Tower Hill. This was a full-scale exercise, with people on the ground responding to a simulated crisis. At the beginning of July 2005, two different desktop exercises were run, one by the Metropolitan Police, codenamed Hanover, and the other by Deutsche Bank. Both exercises were based around multiple attacks on the London Underground network. On July 7th, the real bombings coincided with an exercise in London and one in New York, both based around attacks on underground trains. We were running an exercise for a company in the city of London to train them to be crisis managers, and we happened to produce uh, and prepare a scenario based on, would you believe, simultaneous bombings, as, almost as if it was happening for real. And then it did happen for real. However, the conditioning of the public did not stop then. For long after 7-7, the same details turned up again and again in training exercises and other simulations of terrorism. Two weeks after 7-7, four men set off devices in rucksacks on three trains and a bus. A fifth man dumped his bag in a park. Contrary to 7-7, CCTV was made publicly available. None of the devices went off, and though the men were put on trial, they were not prosecuted under terrorism legislation. A charge of conspiracy to cause explosions likely to endanger life was left out of the prosecution. Their defence was that their actions were not intended as suicide bombings, but were some kind of protest. In July 2007, they were convicted of conspiracy to murder. A day after their mock attack, the police shot dead Jean-Charles de Menezes, supposedly because they believed he was one of the attempted bombers. I see his death uh, as part of the whole terror uh, events of the summer. He was a victim of terror in the same way as the 52. In January 2006, Singapore staged a huge terrorism training exercise codenamed North Star 5, which was based on the 7-7 attacks. Simulated bombs went off on trains and at a bus terminal, Mock victims pretended to be dead or injured, and news broadcasts covering the events featured a fake terrorism suspect. 
In September 2006, another Spooks episode featured an unintentional suicide bomber. He believes he is delivering a truck bomb on a timer, but he is duped by a terrorist mastermind who plans to detonate the bomb by remote. At the last minute, police shoot and kill the remote detonator without being sure that they'd got the right man. A year later, in October 2007, yet another episode of Spooks showed a Muslim MI5 agent planting a bomb underneath a train in a false flag attack. Look, Zaf, I know it was a difficult call. The point of the operation was to fabricate an inside job. Three episodes later, the same character from the 2006 episode has been turned into an MI5 informant. He is once again duped by a terrorist mastermind to be an unwitting suicide bomber, who doesn't realise that the car he is driving is carrying a bomb. In what may be a coincidence, only days after this episode broadcast, an alternative documentary called 77 Ripple Effect was released. It advanced the theory that 77 was an inside job, that bombs were planted underneath the trains, that the alleged bombers thought they were taking part in an exercise, that they were shot dead by snipers at Canary Wharf, and that MI5 were probably responsible for the attacks. In October 2008, yet another episode of Spooks was based around quadruple suicide bombings in London. Four men, one of whom is an MI5 agent, are watched closely by the security services. An informant in Pakistani intelligence tells MI5 that the men are only doing a practice run with dummy bombs and that others will carry out the real attacks. The informant double-crosses MI5 and the men are given real bombs. One of the would-be bombers is shot dead by the police, two of the bombs are stopped, and the fourth bomb is detonated by remote. What sense can we make of all this? Various films and television shows, all of which involved the BBC, either predicted 7-7 or promoted various conspiracy theories both before and after the attacks. Several training exercises predicted aspects of the 7-7 attacks, or were based on them, what is the result of this? The most important result is the bifurcation of the public into those who believe the official story and dismiss alternative narratives as conspiracy theories, and those who believe alternative narratives and dismiss the official story as a cover-up. This two-sided dialectical discussion, with neither side giving any ground or even listening to what the other has to say, gets us nowhere. In particular, it gets us nowhere nearer to the truth. That the idea of suicide bomber patsies has been explored so thoroughly in conspiracy-themed entertainment only encourages this. Those who believe the official version dismiss this idea as the stuff of fiction. Those who believe some of the alternative versions see the simulation as the reality. The same applies to the training exercises. They achieve very little in preparing emergency services for real crises. The Operation OSIRIS-2 exercise and the Panorama programme both highlighted how emergency service radios do not work on the underground. And yet, nothing was done and the problem was still there on 7-7. Instead, the exercise simulations are crude propaganda, serving as constant reminders of the threat from terrorism. What would you say to people who say, well, actually the world's become, you know, everyone's taking this too seriously, our airports are getting jammed up, we have to fill in too many forms, it's perhaps gone over the top. We are trying to get as much uh, information to people as we can uh, and to tell them not only what we know, but what we want them to do. So, what is the relevance of Peter Power's training drill on the morning of 7-7? Those who believe the official story will believe it was just a coincidence. Those who believe some of the alternative stories will believe that it was at the centre of a false flag operation it is possible that neither is true. In reality, the targets on 7-7 were obvious and predictable. Was it, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. The London Underground in particular has been bombed by terrorists for over a century. The first fatal bombing was in 1897, three years after Marshal Bourdin became Britain's first suicide bomber. The first multiple bombing of the tube was in 1939, Hitchcock's film Sabotage and the Aldwych bombing 60 years later both showed that buses were also a predictable target. Was the 7-7 exercise, just like the other terror simulations, psychological propaganda? 
Was the exercise a deliberate red herring, a lead that goes nowhere, left for conspiracy theorists to chase? Was the aim to encourage false conspiracy theories? Was it all a diversion from what really happened? We live in an age of simulated terrorism, surrounded by terrifying apparitions that bridge the gap between the real and the possible. We are constantly told about the threat of attack, reminded of it through TV dramas and films, prepared for it by drills and exercises, and conditioned to believe who is responsible. The Home Secretary has said the attacks bear the hallmarks of Al-Qaeda. They say they do believe that it bore all the hallmarks of an Al-Qaeda attack. There is even a virtual terrorism training academy, teaching people how to respond to attacks. The learning lab is where you'll learn the basics of WMD hazmat. All this makes it difficult for people to distinguish between reality and simulation, between the actual and the virtual. We are scared by ghosts. Where do we draw the line in terms of the resources we devote to, to fending off these imaginary risks? Well, they may not be imaginary. That's the whole problem. Well, they, the risk, um, risk is imaginary. Risk is a word that refers to the future. It hasn't happened yet. This was amply demonstrated in 2009. On the 8th anniversary of 9-11, there was a terrorism training exercise on the Potomac River. CNN reported the drill as a real attack. By blurring the lines between news and entertainment, between fact and fiction, it becomes very difficult to figure out what happened on 7-7. Were the four intentional suicide bombers? Were they coerced or manipulated? Were they unwitting dupes? Or were they something else? The 7-7 crime remains unsolved. We do not know who was responsible, but for many people the investigation is already over. The inquests concluded with Lady Justice Hallett ruling that the 52 had been unlawfully killed. Though there was no verdict on the four alleged bombers, she decided that there will be no separate inquests into their deaths. So a key point there, saying that she hoped that this would now bring an end to the investigations. There have, of course, been calls for further inquiries, a judicial inquiry, an independent public inquiry. Hallett's closing report said that there was no reason to doubt that they were responsible. She ridiculed the idea that they had been set up saying that it would have required the fabrication of evidence and a conspiracy of huge proportions. This isn't true, but if there was a huge conspiracy to misrepresent evidence and thus deceive the public, then it wouldn't be the first time that this has happened. Or the second. Or the third. Or the last. Hallett also concluded that no person or institution was to blame. According to the authorities, there was no intelligence failure. Some of the relatives of the victims are still demanding a public inquiry. Any such inquiry can only be meaningful if it is free from the confines of the 2005 Inquiries Act and therefore free from political influence. The evidence must be subject to scrutiny and cross-examination without prejudice. In all likelihood, any such inquiry will be a whitewash, though there is cause for hope. Throughout the second half of the 20th century, Intelligence services within NATO encouraged or sponsored terrorist attacks across Europe. In many cases, the wrong people were blamed and imprisoned. Eventually, when it became clear what had happened, the European Parliament passed a resolution condemning the actions of its member states. Three countries held parliamentary inquiries and exposed what had really happened. In some instances, the innocent were freed and the truly guilty were prosecuted. We must hope for and work towards an honest investigation of 7-7. We can still get to the truth.
well, at one level they did. The bomb went off. But to, I, to describe that as a, a failure is, I think, to misunderstand the nature of what intelligence work is about.